Okay, here we're looking at the chromosomal basis of inheritance, chapter 15. So Mendel left us, left us with these genes or inheritable factors. We know they're genes located on chromosomes, and a gene, again, is just a sequence of DNA that usually encodes for a protein. Um, and we can actually visually tag genes by complementary base pairing and putting on a fluorescent tag. Um, we already talked about um, karyotypes, and again, we have 22 autosomes and two sex chromosomes. And sex determination in humans is determined by females having two X's, males having an X and a Y. Um, because sex chromosomes don't come always don't always come with these homologous pairs, for example, in a male, we don't have a homologous pair, they have really interesting patterns of inheritance. So the X chromosome is a normal, big old chromosome, lots of important genes. Um, the Y chromosome only has a very few number of genes, and most of them are involved in um, male characteristics. In particular, this SRY gene is a transcription factor, meaning it's a master switch. It can go into the nucleus of a cell and turn on lots of other genes required for male sex determination. So, if you have an SRY, you develop as a male. Um, so, if you have two chromosomes, um, but one of them has an SRY, you're going to be male. If you have an X and a Y, but the SRY has been deleted, you will be female. So, X-linked genes. When a gene is on the X chromosome, um, it is said to be X-linked. Right? So, um, eye color, or sorry, not eye color, human color blindness is an example of that. And you write these out like this. So if it's an X-linked gene, you're going to put for females, homozygous dominant. You can have homozygous recessive down here, or you can have homozygous, sorry, you can have heterozygous. For males, there's only two options. You're either dominant or recessive. You can't have that heterozygous trait because you don't have two X's. Um, there are lots of human genetic disorders um, caused by X-linked genes. These are more common in men, and that is because here you have two-thirds chance to be unaffected. Here you have half. Um, so we often use fruit flies um, or Drosophila to determine um, lots to kind of look at X-linked traits um, and to look at genetics in general because they mate really quickly, they have lots of babies, and you can have visual, visual traits. So males can only get the X chromosome from their mothers, right? Um, because they got the Y from the dad, meaning they had to have gotten their X from their mother. If the gene is X-linked and the mom has a recessive phenotype, so for example here, little w, little w, then the male will have that, that, that trait. Um, gene linkage. So gene linkage is when genes are on, so let me rephrase, when genes are on separate chromosomes or very far apart on the same chromosome, this is when you get what's called independent assortment. And you get expected ratios out of that, just like you would expect from Mendelian genetics and your Punnett squares. Right? So if genes are on different chromosomes or genes are very far, far apart on the same chromosome, you get these expected gametes that you get from your Punnett squares. If you have genetic linkage, that means genes are very close together on the same chromosome, and that means the genes are linked, meaning they tend to stick together during meiosis. So instead of having 25, 25, 25, 25, what you get are things that look like the parental chromosomes. The recombinant, which results from crossing over, occurs at a very low rate. We can use this to our advantage to do gene mapping. So again, crossing over occurs in prophase one of meiosis. Um, it occurs between replicated homologous chromosomes where you get genetic swapping. It increases genetic variation. If chromosome, or sorry, if genes are unlinked or very far apart, crossing over occurs and it doesn't change the outcome. If you have gene linkage, in order to get all of the different kinds of gametes, you would have to have crossing over happen right in that little place, and that is rare. 
So Thomas Hunt Morgan used this as a way to kind of map where genes are on a chromosome and how, um, whether genes are linked or whether they are unlinked and how far apart they are from one another. So when you calculate recombination frequency, um, the goal is to kind of to determine whether two genes are linked and if so, how closely they are linked. So what you need to do um, is a is a cross from a true breeding recessive flies to kind of observe this. This is the example that we have here. So here we have true breeding, um, big R, big R, big V, big V, and we have little R, little R, little R, little V, little V. So these are both true breeding. We get this F1 completely heterozygous fly. Um, and then we are going to do a test cross with this Homo, this heterozygous fly to a test cross and saw see what we found, right? And basically, the kicker is if you do not get what you expect from your um, outcome from your Punnett square, if you don't get the expected outcome, then it's probably that your genes are linked, and you can measure how close together they are. And the way you do that is looking at recombination frequency. You look at the number of recombinants. And don't overthink this. Take the small numbers. The small numbers are the recombinants over the total times 100. That gives you the recombination frequency. Um, so for example, um, if we know the recombination frequencies, so here 13.2, 6.4, 19.6, then you can put those onto a map to determine where they are on a chromosome. And one map unit equals one centimorgan equals 1% recombination. So if you're confused about this, just remove this part, looking only at this and trying to figure out, trying to put that on a chromosome. And I think everybody got this in class. Sounds very complicated. In practice, it's not that bad. So here's, um, I gave you a worksheet on this. Um, I think it's posted online somewhere. In general, I usually start with the large recombination frequencies, which are the outermost genes, and then work inward. And, oops, let me go back there, sorry. Um, so here's a practice problem that you should definitely try. So just looking at this right away, um, I can we can figure out what the expected outcome is, and I think the expected is 25% to 25% to 25% to 25%, but we see that's not right. These I know because they're the smaller number are the recombinants. These are going to be the parental. Um, so Thomas Hunt Morgan did this to create an actual fruit fly genetic map. So he's mapped, um, well, he started mapping and many people have come since, mapping showing where all these genes are on the four chromosomes of a fruit fly. Um, okay. So we are going to talk in another one about chi-squared, so I'm going to skip that. So um, one thing to think about sex chromosomes is that you can have what's called X inactivation. Um, so in this occurs in female mammals. For most chromosomes, having an extra or a missing copy is lethal. The X chromosome is funky. Um, human females have two X chromosomes, but the males only have one. And that leads to in a discrepancy between the numbers of chromosomes. So what happens in, in human females, um, in female mammals, is that one of the X chromosome gets inactivated so that males and females are the same now. Um, and the X inactivation is literally just shutting down one of the X chromosomes and it becomes what's called a bar body. So you only get gene expression from one of those chromosomes. The best example, or the, my favorite example, are calico cats, um, where the X inactivation um, causes the different um, pigmentation of a cat. Random X inactivation in a very early embryo can cause either expression of this X chromosome, which causes the orange, or this X chromosome, which causes the black, depending on which X chromosome was inactivated. Um, during meiosis, you can get what's called non-disjunction or bad separation of chromosomes. So remember, meiosis 1, um, homologous chromosomes are separating. Meiosis 2 
it is sister chromatids that are separating. If you get bad separation, called non-disjunction, that leads to trouble. Um, and in particular, that leads to aneuploidy, or having an abnormal number of chromosomes, too few or too many. Non-disjunction in meiosis usually results in aneuploidy, right? And you can try to draw this out and convince yourself of this, um, but I'm gonna go back here. So if you have non-disjunction in meiosis one, that leads to four faulty or aneuploid gametes. If you have non-disjunction occurring here in meiosis two during sister chromatid splitting, that results in two normal gametes and two bad gametes. So non-disjunction results in aneuploidy, and one example of that um, can result in um, uh, Down syndrome or trisomy 21, where you have too many of that one chromosome. Um, and this is very common um, and it goes up with maternal age. Aneuploidy and non disjunction go up with maternal age. And there's actually some evidence showing that that goes up with paternal age too, but the research isn't so great on that. Um, you can get chromosomal rearrangements where you can have a part of a chromosome that is completely deleted. You could get um, part of a chromosome that gets duplicated, or you could have a chromosome where it's there, but it's inverted, all right? Um, you can also have chromosomal rearrangements that occur via what it's called a translocation, where a piece of a chromosome gets attached to another piece of a chromosome. You can have reciprocal translocation, where they swap places, or a non-reciprocal translocation where just a chunk of one goes on to a chunk of another. And again, these don't necessarily result in major issues as long as the genes are there, unless you are, during this chunking out, that you are screwing up genes right, or the sequence of a gene right at those um, transition points. All right, and that is it for chromosomal inheritance.